Thanks, Howard, for sharing your garden with us. And coming up next, we're going to be talking about how to help out wildlife through hot and dry times. Uh, we're all suffering from the drought, but the wildlife is suffering in particular. And joining me to help out with this topic right now is Meredith O'Reilly. Meredith, thank you so much for being a guest on the program. Glad to be here. You have your own blog. It's called greatstems.org. Tell us just real briefly about the blog. Oh, goodness. Well, my Great Stems blog, uh, and it's actually .com. Okay. Uh, it started out as a garden blog, and, you know, I just love wildlife so much. It's sort of become more of my adventures with wildlife, mm -hmm. just as much as my adventures with plants. Filled so. with beautiful images. I, I try. <laughs> they're not as beautiful as some, but I enjoy it. That's great. That's great. And this is a, 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 an important topic. Um, lots of us garden with wildlife, but there is a particular class of gardeners out there who garden for wildlife. They're called wildlife stewards. What does that exactly entail? Uh, habitat stewards are uh, volunteers with the National Wildlife Federation, and we actually go through a training program that um, teaches us more about the native plants in our area and then we uh, go out to the community and we work with homeowners, we work with uh, businesses, different organizations to help create habitat there at, at their locations, help restore habitat, educate the community, help build schoolyard habitats and right. so, far, so forth. All right, well, speaking of, of the hot times that we're dealing with now, the, obviously the most important thing that we can offer to wildlife uh, is water. It's water. Mm -hmm. Right. And this is the essential. And, it, and, it, and it's almost magical the effect having a source of water has in the garden because the amount of wildlife increases exponentially. It really does. And if you have, you know, larger sources of water like, like ponds, then mm -hmm. it's really tremendous how much wildlife gets attracted to your garden. Mm -hmm. But uh, you don't have to have a large pond. You right. don't have to have a small pond. You can work with bird baths and other sources as well. Right. Well, bird baths are uh, easy for most gardeners, but uh, maybe too large for some. And uh, there are alternatives and uh, just simple trays, uh, ceramic trays that will hold the water. Uh, will attract quite a few uh, critters to the garden. Absolutely. I, I have lots of these ceramic saucers in my, in my garden. Mm -hmm. And what's nice about them is that you can put them down low on the ground for toads and frogs. Mm -hmm. You can raise them up onto a stump or a pedestal or a table to uh, keep the birds off the ground to right. keep them safe. Right. They are super easy to clean. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can use them for other purposes. Right. And uh, that's well. what nice thing to think about on the cleaning side is that having the slick surface of a ceramic, for example. And we will talk about hygiene and, and bird baths and, and, and watering things as well. And for those who are wondering later, we will be talking about the fruit. There's a specific purpose for that <laughs> as well. But uh, the, you can put these out on your patio, and you'll be surprised by the amount of wildlife that will come to uh, those. So uh, really great. Now, uh, you also talk about puddling areas. And, what, and for those who aren't familiar with that phrase, what does that mean? It's referring to what butterflies do when they go down to the ground or to sand or, or surface rock surfaces and so forth to get minerals, salts, you know, nutrients. It's usually the male butterflies that do this and its purpose is for reproduction. It helps mm -hmm. uh, those nutrients get transferred to the female and then mm -hmm. they have more successful reproduction. Uh, so puddling is referring to how all those butterflies will go down, not, not just to um, the damp soil, but they'll actually go down to um, dog feces, they'll go down mm -hmm. to uh, dead animals. I mean, it's kind of gross mm -hmm. where they will sometimes get their nutrients, but puddling uh, in the home garden, you can use a saucer like this to keep some damp soil in mm -hmm. so that the butterflies can get those nutrients. Okay, so you can um, uh, put this down into the garden, put a little bit of soil in it, and mm -hmm. actually keep it kind of muddy. Exactly. You can mix in some compost mm -hmm. or uh, some sand or mm -hmm. a, a little salt, and uh, they may go down to it. They may go right to a different area of your garden. You know, you really don't know. But it's just another way that you can attract okay. butterflies. All right. And uh, in, in terms of food sources, there are a lot of different things to consider. You reference the fact that uh, the, the habitat stewards learn about the native plants, and that's obviously where you should start, right? Native plants are absolutely the best food sources for our native wildlife. Mm -hmm. You know, for the for butterflies with where they lay their eggs, um, they need very specific plants. They're caterpillar host plants, and it it's, has to do with the chemistry <coughs> between um, 
that caterpillar and that plant, something that's evolved over many, many right. thousands of years, uh, those caterpillars need very specific plants, mm -hmm. and they are our native plants. Well, they provide the foliage to be eaten for exactly. caterpillars, but they also provide flowers, they provide fruit, mm -hmm. they provide so many other things as well. Fruits, berries, and seeds. Right, seeds, so, exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, These are all things that the wildlife absolutely depends on. And uh, there's nothing better for attracting some of our most colorful birds, I think, than uh, berries and plants. My favorite Absolutely. native plant, just about my favorite. Uh, it's hard to choose, but possum hall holly. Oh, uh, so many, so many berries on there. A, a great berry plant and uh, cedar wax wings and the mockingbirds. It's just a wonderful thing to have in the garden, and mm -hmm. it attracts a lot of vibrancy, I think, to Absolutely. the garden Absolutely, and of course, summertime isn't the time to be planting these plants. Mm -hmm. You want to plan ahead for fall. Right. Uh, so, so summertime, you can actually be thinking about what you do want to plant, mm -hmm. and then you will plant the plants that will either blossom next summer or mm -hmm. provide the seeds or provide shade. Right. Uh, but you want to do all that kind of planting in the fall. One tip that you like to give has to do with uh, when it comes to the plants is leaving seed heads on the plants for a longer period of time. And I have found that, for example, like with echinacea, you know, my tendency is to go in there and clean up the garden. Mm -hmm. But on a lot of plants like echinacea or a lot of other kinds of coneflower type things, um, if you leave the, uh, some of those seeds behind, mm -hmm. it re you'll see the birds out there working those plants. Absolutely. Uh, purple coneflower is, is one of my favorites because the birds mm -hmm. will just go down and, and land there and, and pull those seeds out. And, mm -hmm. and sunflowers, you see it a lot with the sunflowers. So the, mm -hmm. the bees go crazy when the flower's in bloom, but as soon as it starts to not look quite so pretty, it uh, attracts in those finches. Mm -hmm. I know you love lesser gold finches. They right. love the sunflowers and uh, the cardinals and so right. forth. So don't be so quick to tidy up. Right. Well, supplemental feeding is always something that um, people want to do. And there are some do's and don'ts. Let's start with the do on the, uh, the, the, the feeding mixes that you like. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what I'm holding here, has a mix of, of striped sunflower, black oiled sunflower, Peanuts. I see safflower mm -hmm. and some Niger thistle in there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, this is your preferred mix, right? It really is. Uh, most of our songbirds are going to be drawn to these seeds, uh, and then uh, that cracked corn is also yeah, in there's, there. Yeah, there's a little cracked corn in here as well. And uh, you'll have blue jays and woodpeckers come to that. They'll they'll look for those <laughs> peanuts. The chickadees love the peanuts, and almost all of them will like that black oil sunflower and you don't have to get the seeds that have the holes if you mm -hmm. want to reduce the amount of, of hole right. mess that may result. Right, yeah. But uh, It's always part of the equation. I add it to my compost and yeah, it works it's out easy. just fine. It's easy to deal with. Okay, on the don't list <laughs> is this millet seed. Millet and I think that's Milo in there and, mm -hmm. it's, and you can see how very little uh, sunflower they actually mm -hmm. added to that mix. So this mm -hmm. is this is a, a cheaper mix that you might find in a grocery store, right. uh, but the the birds that are more attracted to this are the English house sparrows mm -hmm. and the white winged doves and the starlings. They like to eat that seed direct mm -hmm. directly without having the holes on it. Right. So if you're having a problem with English house sparrows, well, anybody who has even one yeah. English house sparrow yeah, is a having problem. a problem. Right. Uh, they are pest birds, right. and we really want to discourage them. So. Removing that seed mm -hmm. from your mix is okay. your best bet. And I said we would talk about the fruit in, in this, and, and putting fruit out uh, is great for the butterflies, correct? It's great for the butterflies, it's great for mockingbirds, any any birds that love the fruit, mm -hmm. uh, you may find some mammals visiting as well. All but right. the butterflies uh, will love the oranges, they love bananas, they love rotten bananas, mm -hmm. not fresh bananas. They like the really gross ones. Okay. And, uh, but, but putting out a little, a little fresh fruit salad for your wildlife okay. it can bring a lot in. And then real briefly on hummingbird feeders, uh, we, we don't have time to talk about much uh, here, but we have uh, a preferred hummingbird feeder. And why is something like this one a preferred feeder? Well, both this one, and if you can see this one also, mm -hmm. they have all red on them. Right. And uh, and they're very very easy to clean. Can mm -hmm. I can I sure. open this up? Yeah. So 
just open when you, it up? When you have a hummingbird feeder, you want to make sure that it's super easy to clean. And you can see that you can get to all surfaces mm -hmm. in here. And then same with that one. When you open it up. And it's very easy it's, to get to. It's very, very easy to, to open. And I'll kind of show this to our, our audience. We don't have that much time left. But, you know, one of the hardest areas to clean are the little ports where the, they actually sit. But there are brushes available, I'm sure, at mm -hmm. wildlife stores. Absolutely. And you can, and they're specially made just for this purpose, which is really great. Mm -hmm. I definitely recommend that. And then I use a, a brush that you would use for a baby bottle. Mm -hmm. I use that to clean the inside with right. some vinegar. So good hygiene is really important on mm -hmm. these things. You don't definitely. Want to, you, don't, you, you track the birds, you don't want to make them ill. Mm -hmm. So real briefly, again, I want to give people a chance to connect with you. The website is greatstems.com. Yes. And it's a blog, and uh, again, uh, from what our producer says, some gorgeous wildlife images for everybody <laughs> to check out and see. Thank you. And thank you so much, Meredith O'Reilly, for being our guest today. And we hope that you've learned a few things out there that will help our feathered and other friends through the drought. Uh, coming up next is our friend Daphne. <laughs>